some of this is going to be crossover from the urinary chapter. Um, a little bit of it is going to be that way, just because, like, um, you know, the, the re urethra and the penis share um, functional um, use with the urinary system as well as the male reproductive system. So we'll see that. Um, we'll look at this view uh, or this picture a couple times as we're moving through. Um, so I'm not going to pause on it here. Um, simple functions of the male reproductive system is to essentially to reproduce. And so um, propagation is why male and female are here um, to populate the earth. And that's how we as a species continue to survive. And so the male specifically does that, plays his role in sperm, which we see in that first point here. Um, you know, this is kind of the main thing that the male adds to the soup, if you will, when um, sexual relationships take place in order to produce a child. And testosterone being the main male hormone that um, one drives uh, the, the sexual um, instinct of the male um, in order to then have sperm that is readily, readily available for the female when it's time to reproduce. So that is just kind of a basic overview of the function at a you know, 30,000 foot level. Um, the, the male external genital genitalia, and if you went through the text, um, you saw the genitalia was just defined as the reproductive organs, um, whether it's male or female. Um, we call it genitalia, external being outside of the body and internal genitalia obviously being inside of the body. Um, so for the male, external would be the penis um, and basically the scrotum. Um, and inside the scrotum, of course, are the testicles or the testes along with um, their component, um, the like the epidymis and the part of the vas deferens is there as well. Um, so we see those can also be considered part of the external genitalia. Internally then, that's where we get the majority of the vas deferens, um, the seminal vesicle, the prostate gland, um, which we talked about a little bit yesterday, then leading to the urethra, of course, then, um, then we start seeing um, the external portion after that point. So here's that picture kind of blown up and um, we see the, the external portion of the uh, reproductive system here. Again, testes, epidymis, and then the vas deferens pulls up um, along with um, <clears throat> the, uh, the spermatic cords that are leading to the epidymis as well, and then the testicle itself, and then the penis, urethra um, externally. And then internally, we kind of see it's this whole section here, but not including the bladder, um, but going around the bladder, if you will. And this next slide, I think it's the next slide, will, oh, this slide here explains it a little bit better. So, um, but you can kind of see how these arrows pull around the bladder. And we're gonna go back to this here in just a second, but I wanna hit these slides here. So. Uh, testes or testicle, that is where the sperm are produced, as well as testosterone. Um, the sperm itself, or spermatozone, um, is got its own term, and that is where the DNA, um, the cellular DNA for the male, is kept and then transferred into the junction um, with the female egg. Um, testosterone, again, we mentioned that just being that, ma that main sex hormone that is also produced in the testicle as well. So the testicles are very important, um, not, just to, not just to the guy, but to you know, life in general as far as reproduction, because without it, um, we don't get the production of sperm and we don't get the testosterone, which it, you know, it's not just the sex drive, but it's one of the things that make men men and the male, the male sex, the male sex. 
Um, it is responsible for um, increased muscle mass, increased um, you know, attitudes, tempers, the way we do things, uh, also chivalry, the protective instinct over females, um, all of the things that, that really make a man a man are, are grounded in testosterone. Um, unfortunately, sometimes those things are not controlled and used appropriately. And sometimes the things that make a man a man make a man a very, very poor man, um, or, you know, shouldn't be, you know, given the title of man, but, you know, the, a boy that can shave because they don't know how to handle the responsibility of the testosterone that they have. Um, and we see that, unfortunately, um, in today's culture to a huge extent. You know, we see um, fatherless systems um, that lead to more and more fatherless systems because men have this incredible physical um, dominating nature due to testosterone. And they have the ability to reproduce very, very easily and quickly without any of the, quote, responsibility of carrying a child to the term. And so, um, unfortunately, I think I'd mentioned um, foster care in, in the past couple of sections at, at one time or another. And it's something that, you know, we see in that system over and over and over again. Um, and not to put all the blame on, on dads, because it's not, there's a lot of bad moms out there too, but we'll talk about that next in the next section. But um, yeah, the, the fatherless aspect of our society is really, really poor. And unfortunately, testosterone has something to play in that. It, it leads to that because again, it's, it's a lack of self-control and it's a lack of managing responsibly the responsibility we have as men in order to harness that testosterone for the things that it's meant to be used for, which is, again, protection and provision of our, um, of our mate and of our children. You know, that's why we have the, the, the male ability that we do, the increased muscle mass and everything else. Like that's, that's how the human was designed. Um, but it's, we're also designed with the ability to take that train and run it right off the rails if we so desire. And unfortunately, we see that. Um, I'm going to try to resist going on and on about the cultural issues that we have and, and, and all of that and try to stick to medical terminology. But it's a good thing. It is a good thing to talk about. It's something that I don't think our culture talks about enough and puts enough emphasis or responsibility on. Um, especially, you know, growing up in the young adult years, we make it too easy for, for dads to leave. And we make it too easy for moms to abandon children as well. And um, it's something that um, it's just a lack of responsibility for what we've been given in our bodies. And we all want to be able to use that for our own pleasure and good. But then when it comes to the responsibility aspect of it, um, not everybody is willing to, you know, to man up to that responsibility. Okay, that's where I'll stop with that. Thank you for bearing with that. Uh, the, the sperm then <clears throat> uh, is an interesting little fellow here, as you can see, kind of looks nasty and like a, <laughs> like a virus almost, or a, a bacteria or a parasite. Um, but really what we see is that the, the sperm itself, the majority of it, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get my drawer back here. The majority of it is the head. And that's where you, you have the nucleus inside the head and you have all of the DNA from dad inside of the head of that sperm. Now, when the sperm attaches to the egg, you basically have this cutting off of the tail. Um, which includes this piece right here, which is the mitochondria. So there is DNA in the mitochondria as well. And maternal cells, the egg, have the nucleus. So if this is our maternal egg, we have a nucleus, but then we also have these mitochondria inside of the female. I did not mean to make that look like either a bowling ball or a person, I'm sorry. It looks creepy, but. 
that's your cell, this is your nucleus, your mitochondria of the female. And in so you've got most of your DNA in the nucleus, but you do have some DNA in the mitochondria. Now in the male, we don't see that because once the sperm attaches to the egg, then this latches off and we lose all of the male's mitochondrial DNA. It just, it becomes absorbed by the female body and, and excreted. And it, no, and it doesn't go into any of the genetic information of this union between the male and the female. So in essence, what you have then is you've got this nuclear DNA of the male and the female coming together, but only the mitochondrial DNA of the female. So when doing things like lineage um, or heredity scans into, you know, into your past, if you're looking at the full genetic DNA makeup of that, um, you've got a huge problem because now you've got to look at mom's side and dad's side and then their parents and then their parents' parents and, and then you just get this huge dif uh, dilution of genetic material until you get down to who you are. And essentially that's what we are. We're all genetic dilutions of our ancestors. But if we only look at mitochondrial DNA of, of a person, doesn't matter if they're male or female, we all have mitochondrial DNA, that mitochondrial DNA only comes from the mother side or the maternal side of your heritage. Because of that, it doesn't get diluted because mom is passing mitochondrial DNA down to child. That child passes mitochondrial DNA down to child, down to child, down to child. Now, of course, this is only in, in females because um, the, the male is losing and not passing along their mitochondrial DNA. But as a male, you're still born with mitochondrial DNA, but it's been passed down to you from your mother. So whether you're male or female, you have mitochondrial DNA that comes from your mom alone. Uh, mitochondrial DNA, for example, is what is mostly responsible for your metabolism ability. The mitochondria is the um, sort of engine or the plant, the energy plant of your cells. So people like um, Lance Armstrong, who is just literally a genetic beast of an athlete, his mitochondrial DNA, so the mitochondria, the, the energy plants of his cells were just off the charts amazing. And that all came from his maternal lineage. Um, and when he goes and, and passes on to his kids, he's not going to be passing that maternal mitochondrial um, genetic onto his children. Now his, his children will benefit from his normal DNA, but they are not gonna get that genetic DNA. Sorry, that mitochondrial DNA. Um, the other thing that allows you to do is at least track through your maternal heritage, um, sort of who or what as far as, um, you know, like uh, um, race or country of origin, those individuals in your past were, because you're not diluting that mitochondrial DNA as it passes down from, you know, year to year to year to year through the females. All right, so I'm sorry if I geeked out a little bit on that section, um, but I, I really enjoy that kind of stuff. So that is sometimes why I will do that. I apologize if it's going overboard or just too much information. So the origination and transportation of the sperm, um, this is a really good slide because we talked about how the, the sperm itself is originating in the testicle. So it gets produced here and then it gets pumped into the epididymis or epididymis and it gets stored there. So it's sort of like a holding chamber for, to be ready to um, ejaculate sperm at the moment's notice, right? As soon as, as, soon as that, um, <clears throat> the attraction is there and the, the mating is about to happen um, biologically, you've got a, a storage of 
sperm ready to go. Your testicles don't have to make it on demand and then pump it up and ready to go. It's already there and stored ready to go. And so that's kind of the holding chamber. And then the vast def rounds, which is following up this line here, wraps up around your bladder and then jumps, dumps into the seminal vesicle, which itself is another storage facility um, for sperm. And then the, the vesicle duct is what drops into the prostate gland. And the prostate gland essentially is what milks or pumps that semen into the urethral canal. So of course, urine stored in the bladder comes through the urethra as well, sort of passing through the, um, through the, the prostate. And we said last week that the prostate, so imagine if, like, if this is your um, urethra coming out of your bladder, and then this is your prostate, it's not like inside of the prostate, but imagine the prostate's got, it's, in, it's enclosed itself. And then as it squeezes, it sort of milks that urethra in order to squeeze out either urine, allowing it to uh, the natural recoil and pressure inside the bladder to push the urine out, or to squeeze and pump out the semen um, as it, and the sperm as it's necessary. So this is where we see issues with the prostate gland. But when, the, when a prostate then is malfunctioning or becomes cancerous or becomes hypertrophied, you know, whatever the problem happens to be, then it can cause major issues with urination because if it gets hypertrophied and it squeezes and you can't get that urine out like you normally would, then it, it causes a huge problem with urinary retention and on-demand urination for males. But also then if it's not squeezing appropriately, then that's where you can get some, um, some problems where men are infertile and they're unable to ejaculate the sperm um, when it's necessary because the prostate simply isn't working. Uh, so we continue the, the flow then out of the prostate gland and then that dumps into the urethra. So it's got a separate little channel that dumps into the urethra and then that gets pumped out through, um, of course, the penis in order to inseminate uh, the female. So that understanding is pretty important just to kind of understand how it loops up and around. For the most part, the, the male reproductive system is very basic. There's not a whole lot to it. So we don't have a, a ton of terminology um, relating to it. Essentially, we have the testicle, the epididymis, the vans deferens, seminal vesicle, and the prostate. And then, of course, the urethra and the penis. Um, so there's not a whole lot to it as far as a system is concerned. Uh, so the <clears throat> seminiferous tubule, tubules are actually inside of the testicle. So we can't see them on this image, but they're inside of this. So this sort of like blue loop-de-loop -loop would be like your, your seminiferous tubules. And kind of like what we saw with the kidneys and the nephron yesterday, where you've got the glomerulus and you've got all of these capil capillaries that kind of run in it and it abs absorbs and does its diffusion there. That's kind of a similar way to think about um, the, the tubules um, because you've just got all of these tubes that are collecting this production of sperm and then putting it out into the epididymis. And of course we said the epididymis then is your storage spot before it's needed to be pumped up into the seminal duct or the vas deferens. Uh, seminal vesicles, uh, remember, and if you need to look at a, an image while you're doing this on page seven, I'm sorry, 258 of chapter seven, um, it shows figure seven two is the image with the arrows that we just looked at. And the previous page, um, 257, shows the larger picture without the arrows. Um, after the seminal vesicles, back into the prostate gland, um, and then out of the penis. The scrotum, we really haven't talked about too much. The scrotum is just the word for the sac that contains the, the testicles and the epididymis and the, the bottom part of the um, vas deferens. Um, 
basically it's just a sack of skin that holds those items in there. And it does have a, a, some amount of muscle ability to contract or extend in order to keep the testicles warm. So um, uh, for, for a lack of a better term, you've probably all heard someone um, use the terminology shrinkage before, probably in a, you know, like a slapstick type of movie. Um, but, you know, someone goes swimming in a mountain lake and the water's cold and they don't want to get out because of the shrinkage or, you know, just something ridiculous kind of like that. But there's a, there's a real reproductive um, reason for shrinkage and that shrinkage is to bring those testicles up close to the body in order to keep them warm in order to keep that sperm viable that is being held inside of the scrotum and then when the male is not in a cold environment and it's just okay it's my my testicles are warm enough then you have that relaxation and that's where the scrotum will um, extend out and you, you don't have that shrinkage um, if you will. Um, just kind of a, a side note, um, working in the healthcare um, facilities, you guys, if you haven't already, those that work there, um, you know, you're going to see the male genitalia. It's going to happen. Um, as a male working in, in the healthcare and emergency rooms and ICUs, I, I, you know, I don't now because I'm not working in those facilities right now, but um, I would see female genitalia constantly, you know, upstairs and downstairs. It, do, it doesn't matter. Um, but when you're, when you're there, you know, I know we're talking about reproduction right now and there's that sexual component to that. But when you're taking care of somebody and you're doing that job, there's an amazing ability of your mind to completely separate like your internal native instincts to reproduce and those instincts to care and take care of somebody you know we're attracted to people for a reason in order to have that ability to reproduce um, and we're not attracted to other people for a good reason you know so it, it allows you or me as a male to go into a um, emergency room and take care of a late teen or young 20 female who is in a, a accident that you know we've she's coding or just needs our real immediate care and clothes are stripped off and we're going to town working on this body trying to keep her alive um, but in that like you're fully exposed to all genitalia likewise with with men and and females you're you're seeing scrotums and penises all the time oftentimes you have to help them sorry <laughs> you have to go and help them into the washroom. Sometimes you have to hold their penis while they urinate into a bedside commode or a bedside urinal. Those types of things happen and that's part of getting into healthcare. Um, I promise you, at least I, I feel safe in saying this, like you're not going to feel um, you know, turned on for a lack of a better term in those types of situations, right? There's nothing about it that is like, oh yeah, this is you know, invigorating. It's not. When you see someone torn up laying on a hospital bed, you, there's nothing about that that's attractive, right? You're, you're there to help this person and do your job. Um, it's not to say we don't have some people that are sick and, and have some mental problems and take advantage of these things because we, we hear about them from time to time and it truly is sick and disgusting when that type of stuff happens. But um, just, you know, I, I want this class to also not just be medical terminology, but to help you guys understand what you're going to see and what that's going to be like in the medical field. So I'll try to, you know, I'll try to point stuff like this out when I think it's appropriate and hopefully I will keep it appropriate. That's my goal anyway. Um, so we talked um, a little bit in general about the penis, but looking more specifically at the penis, there's, we can break that down into different sections. Um, so obviously the, the, the whole thing in general is, is termed the penis, but the glands penis is the enlarged tip that's at the end of the penis. And if you look on page, oh, I think it's 258 again. No, 257, you'll see um, 
some of these terms label. So the enlarged tip, um, you will not always see this because if the patient is uncircum, I'm sorry, if they're uncircumcised, yeah, if they're uncircumcised, you have the prepuce or the foreskin that's covering up that tip of that penis. And only when that, when the, that person needs to urinate or clean themselves, or if they're going to be sexually active, will that foreskin in the, in the time of erection, that foreskin will pull itself back so that the penis can ejaculate during um, uh, urination. Again, you've got to pull that foreskin back. If you've not been circumcised or you have patients who are uncircumcised, then you run a higher risk of infection uh, because it's harder to clean that flap of skin, especially with urine that, and you guys, if you have boys at all or have ever lived with a guy, um, they're not always great with where the pee goes, right? They, it's like pee is everywhere in a, in a bathroom when you have boys. Um, and, and likewise, okay, so if you're uncircumcised, you can see like how not handling urine in an appropriate fashion can cause major issues as far as infection with uh, the male penis. Um, so that's really those three areas and really just the two, the glands, penis, and the prepuce or the foreskin are the major sections that need to be identified um, with, with the penis. All right, our combining forms, um, basically similar to what we've talked about, just a, a, few, um, a few extra um, word roots that are um, explained in terminology. The first one here, um, if you're looking at your chart on page 215, actually not listed there. Um, but ander or andro, it just basically means, um, so if you hear something with andro, that's just uh, meaning to the male um, in general. Um, and then the rest of these, uh, balano uh, is referring to the glans penis or the, the end of the penis, the enlarged portion that is typically um, underneath the foreskin, um, unless you're circumcised. And then um, obviously then that foreskin is no longer there. Um, the epididyme uh, is fairly straightforward as it relates to the epididymis. Um, orchid, orchio, or orco um, is referring to the testicles, and oftentimes test is the um, combining form that is going to be used most often. Um, however, if you do see that orc in there, that's specifically referring to it. Prostate or prostato, prostate. Um, the vaso uh, towards the seminal vesicle, um, I'm sorry, or not the seminal, that's vesiculo is seminal vesicle, and vas or vaso is um, just more or less the vessel or a duct. <clears throat> um, some commonly used uh, terms, um, we mentioned andro just a moment ago, and then spermo or spermato, we'll see those common, and then only one suffix um, with ism, uh, referring to a state of or pertaining to in some cases. These words can be broken down and you'll find um, several exercises in the text in which you can actually go ahead and add and break them down parts. Uh, is familiar to us. So the balan and the balano, um, the epididide or epididide, orchio, prostato, so lots of familiar terms here as it um, refers to those organs or of the male reproductive system. Some disease and disorder terms that are not built from word parts. Uh, again, these are just common words. They can be eponyms or even acronyms or just modern English language terms. So something like child dysfunction would be one of those modern English terms. Um, also assigned to it a acronym, so ED. Of course, we hear more about this on TV than we do anything else with all of the erectile dysfunction medications like um, Viagra and Sildenafil, uh, things like that. Of course, you've got the, the couple sitting in a bathtub on top of some mountain bluff lookout um, in all of those commercials, which seems always strange to me, but I guess it sells its little pills, so it works. Um, 
hydrocell or hydroseal. Uh, there's a picture in your text on page 265 of this. It's figure 7-5. Uh, this is a, an interesting condition um, where often, well, not often, you'll see it sometimes in newborn males where you've got excess fluid inside of the scrotum. And in newborn males until they get closer to puberty, if their testes are up actually in their abdomen a little bit, more in their inguinal area, um, before they actually descend into the scrotum. Um, so sometimes you will see some fluid collection and some actual swelling of the scrotum in the newborn, and that's called a hydrocele. You will also see this in adult males, uh, typically older, and it can be caused by a number of things, uh, infection being one of them. Um, as well as abdominal fluid that is now draining into, sometimes you will see a very swollen um, scrotum that looks incredibly painful, um, but it's basically just filled with fluid like you're seeing in um, figure seven five, probably like, you know, like grapefruit sized swelling. So several times, um, several times larger in swelling uh, due to that excess fluid in those areas. Uh, some of these other terms, uh, phimosis, um, priapism, again, kind of some weird, weird terms that are a little bit more difficult to, I guess, try to remember or understand. So you, you see the definitions listed for you there on page 265 that you can um, start working into your memory. Again, here, unless you're working in a, a urologist's office, you're probably not going to see these a lot um, or talk about them a lot. Um, priapism, you may hear on a um, ED commercial. Uh, basically, they'll just say, you know, if you've experienced an erection for more than five hours and it's painful, then um, that is actually the, the appropriate medical term for that is priapism. Um, so you may hear sort of that being described on on popular uh, TV, but um, definitely you're not going to hear about it too much just in a normal healthcare facility unless you are in the um, urinary specialty or the um, urologist specialty. Um, so a vera, varico seal, then the varico is relating to the spermatic cord. There we go. And um, so they can become enlarged as well. And so then the seal aspect of it, um, just meaning, of course, that protrusion out um, or um, in sort of like swollen aspect of it, but using also a uh, a protrusion like we saw a diaphragmatocele in the respiratory component where um, there's a protrusion out of the diaphragm. So we can see the same thing here with the um, enlarged veins of the um, spermatic cord. Some surgical terms, again these are all kind of relating back to the word parts we've talked about. So the balano talking about the glands, penis, epididymis, ectomy, orchid, orchi, um, orchi, orchido, Again, and just depending on the, the suffix is going to explain what the surgical term is. So ectomy or tomy, and then the orchid, meaning the testicle, otomy, um, all of those listed there, plasty. So these are all, again, very familiar suffixes we've used on, in almost every section. And then we're just changing the word root that is going in front of those. So once you start to, you know, current and more, uh, common way of doing that is laparoscopic, in which case they make three small incisions and those three small incisions would be coming through um, in about the same area as we were looking at before, but they're all just smaller in order to get the tools inside and they've got these three arms that come in um, in order to basically remove, cut up and remove the prostate gland. Uh, this is from a surgical perspective is much less invasive. Um, it's still going to be painful and you're, you're still making incisions and cutting into the body. You're going through muscle tissue. However, you're not slicing muscle tissue um, in a large way that is going to cause, um, you know, some major um, rehab time or recovery time. It'll be much shorter with laparoscopic procedures. That's not to say that they're simple and you won't have um, a recovery time because usually there's, anytime you're cutting into the abdominal region, um, usually between five and 
and 10 days of recovery time. Um, another really common mode of, of surgery um, with the male reproductive system is a vasectomy. And in a vasectomy, they're basically uh, cutting part of the vas deferens, um, which is that tube that wraps around the bladder and then down to the testes, which is the, the tube for the sperm to travel from the testes um, eventually out of the body. So a lot of times uh, males will have a vasectomy done, in which case they just snip those vas deferens and they actually snip them in two places and then tie knots around each end of it in order to make sure that they are fully um, going to not be in connection. So if this is not done correctly and if they just do one snip, there are cases reported where the vas deferens can grow back together and um, you can end up having children even after you've had a vasectomy. There is that um, failure. Uh, so snipping it in both sides and tying both sides in knots is typically um, how that is done um, currently. That is again a common um, procedure that you'll see with the male reproductive system. Uh, looking at a couple surgical terms that are not built from uh, word parts. Ablation, <clears throat> you'll see in several different areas of medicine. Uh, ablation in a general term means to remove. In a more specific terms, um, such as if cardiac ablation, it, we actually go in and burn out or create scar tissue over a certain troublesome area of tissue. So um, ablation could be applied to just about any um, organ or system, just depending on what the issue is. We, we typically see it in some systems more than other, um, but we see it in pulmonary system, trying to help reduce asthmatic um, inflammation and constriction. And we see it very common in the cardiac aspect. Um, circumcision is fairly common and well known. Typically, this happens on the eighth day uh, for children after they're born. They'll be circumcised and um, remove that foreskin um, off of the end of the penis, which um, you know now is basically just a, um, a uh, done for cleanliness region reasons and infection control. Um, I think that there's probably you know, maybe a physical, you know, or a visual appeal to having the circumcision done. And so um, a lot of parents will have it done just for the fact that they don't want their kid to not be uncircumcised when just about everyone else is circumcised. But from a health related perspective, the infection really is um, the issue that we're going to see most with uncircumcised children. Um, and then the elderly as well, as they're unable to care for themselves. Um, the hydrocelectomy. Um, here's a, a little bit of a, actually, I would say it is built from word parts. If you see ectomy and then hydrocele, um, you know, you're surgically removing the ectomy, um, the hydrocele. So um, I kind of disagree with the author in putting this word in this area here. Um, Radical prostatectomy. Uh, well, we know what a prostatectomy is, um, and then the radical aspect of it, meaning the entire um, prostate. So they're going in and removing everything out of there, not leaving anything behind. Suprapubic prostatectomy, we already looked at that. And then the TUIP, the TUMT, and the TERPS, these are all transurethral approaches to removing. Um, either the prostate gland um, or doing some type of like therapy to it in order to destroy the prostate gland. And I think I've got it here, yeah. So this would be a transurethral approach, which is very similar to a catheterization in the males. Um, the difference between instead of a Foley catheter coming in here, you have your um, resector scope um, or like an endoscope. But this one is specifically has obviously a camera so you can see what you're doing, but then tools that allow you to remove um, chunks of tissue. So a transurethral approach to a prostatectomy is called a TERP. 
and we regularly see patients undergo TERPs um, in the hospital. It's a very common procedure um, in order to remove the prostate, even more so than um, the laparoscopic um, version. So rarely will we see the suprapubic open, um, and then sometimes we'll see laparoscopic, but most commonly we're seeing this procedure here with the transurethral. Some diagnostic terms, um, here you can see uh, a, a couple of terms and their associated acronyms. Some of them like PSA uh, is a little bit more familiar to us because you know, everyone over the age of 50, for example, is supposed to have a PSA, um, in, in which case if the prostate is failing or if it is cancerous, it will release a specific antigen into your bloodstream. And if you test then the PSA, you'll be able to identify if you're having prostate issues on your patients. That will usually lead to the bottom one on the list here, which is the digital rectal exam. Um, that's the one where you kind of have the, it almost gets uh, slapstick humor again, where you've got the physician putting on the rubber glove and making it snap when he puts the rubber glove on him and having his patient bend over is, he does a digital rectal, rectal exam in order to palpate the uh, prostate. So something that um, all older men will experience or should experience on regular checkups, it is a very good way to screen for prostate cancer. And prostate cancer is one of those items that um, obviously, like, like any cancerous item, you wanna check it and find it early. I mean, if you don't, it can cause major issues and in, including um, involving the rest of your body if you do not check it early. Um, some other complementary terms, andropathy, aspermia, oligospermia, spermatolysis. <clears throat> so all of these um, relating to their word roots, so andro male, um, pathy, um, study of, aspermia. Here we're, we're saying that we have um, a, a division here with the, the prefix a, meaning lack of or no sperm. And so after uh, you have a vasectomy done, then they will do a semen analysis, which I think we'll see on the next slide or two, um, abbreviated as SA, in order to see if inside the semen, you still have any viable sperm. Because if you still have viable sperm after a vasectomy, that means it wasn't um, sufficiently done and your patient needs to know that you're, you've still got sperm swimming around down there. So if you're sexually active, um, then pregnancy is a, a reality of that. Oligospermia, just like what we saw with aurea or anuric and oligouric or oligouria, um, you hear a decrease in or an unusual or scanty amount of sperm. So um, sometimes a patient that has gone through a vasectomy may have oligospermia in that maybe one of the testicles, vas deferens, were successfully separated, whereas the other one was not, or maybe it was partially separated, or maybe there's a partial reconstitution of it. The other thing we'll see with um, infertile men or sterile men is that sometimes even without um, any type of procedure, they're just sterile for whatever reason. And so they may be aspermic or just very low sperm counts. And that would be oligospermia would be the medical term for that. Some, some other complementary terms not built from word parts. Um, some of these are, are familiar. We see several sexually transmitted diseases here, um, which I think everyone learns about in, in grades or in middle school or high school at some point. Um, Coitus, which is just another term for, um, for sexual um, interaction or sexual intercourse, um, not commonly heard. Um, condom, ejaculation, I think those are all, again, basic health class um, terminology that, that everybody learns um, growing up. <clears throat> Artificial insemination, um, let's say you've got a, um, a fertile female, but in a non-fertile or sterile male um, who, you know, you're, you're wanting to have a baby, you're wanting to start a family and you're unable to, the sperm from 
a different male could be artificially inseminated or implanted into um, a, the female and you would have that artificial insemination so it does not take place through sexual intercourse. Um, anytime you talk about the non-natural non ways of uh, reproducing, um, you start to introduce moral and ethical considerations. So one thing that you will expect um, in any of your health programs as you move through different areas and you talk about different things, um, usually relating to the beginning of life and to the end of life, you're going to have moral and ethical conversations in your classes about those things. And, you know, artificial insemination is one of those items, um, specifically dealing with how are, you know, how are the embryos and the eggs and the sperms handled. Um, while they're sort of being waiting to be used or um, waiting to, to not be used at some point. You can actually take an, a, a sperm and an egg outside of the human body and combine them. And then you've got your embryo and then they'll implant that embryo into the female. And sometimes, usually when you do this, the um, facility, the, they'll put together you know, a, a whole bunch of these sperms and eggs. And then over the course of several different attempts to implant these embryos, some of them will take on the first, but most will not. And so second, third, fourth attempts are often needed in order to, to have that take place. Um, and then what happens when you do get pregnant and you've still got hundreds of these fertilized embryos in waiting, um, there becomes an ethical consideration of, you know, how does that get disposed of? Should it be disposed of? Should it be something that even takes place? So those are some types of ethical considerations just around insemination, not even regarding to the carrying out of a pregnancy or the birth or abortion of one, um, but just in the actual insemination aspect of it. There's a lot of uh, moral and ethical issues that um, should be considered in in these discussions. I'm um, looking at a few others. We see a whole bunch of more STDs um, listed here. Um, we've mentioned infertility a few times, um, orgasm as being the, the climax of the sexual stimulation, puberty as when um, you actually you know get to that reproducible age, which is going to be different for everybody. Um, typically, females reach that um, puberty a little bit sooner um, just based on age than males. We see females typically develop their sexual organs um, in their mature, uh, you know, a mature level quicker than males do. Um, some males, there's a huge variation, you know, some males at the age of 12, like my son was telling me he's 12, the seventh grader. He's got friends that have like mustaches and look like they've been pumping iron for eight years. And then there's others that barely have any armpit hair and still have high pitched voices. And, you know, there's a wide range, even, even up into like freshman year of high school. But typically by then, um, most males have uh, gone through puberty. Whereas females typically fifth grade, sixth grade. Um, so 10, 11 years old is, is typically when females will start to go into puberty. Uh, Here's just a, another long list of sexually transmitted diseases that are listed here. And then finishing up with abbreviations, including um, the um, immunodeficiency and um, viruses and disorders, um, erectile dysfunction, we've listed that before, PSA, the TERPs, the TUMS, the TWIPs, um, sexually transmitted diseases, all of those there. So. Um, those we've already covered, so I'm not going to belabor on those. And I think we'll be, yeah, finishing up just.